poor visibility in places and a touch of frost in those areas where we keep the clear skies. Staying damp in the northeast of England, eastern Scotland, but drier elsewhere and a little milder for western Scotland and Northern Ireland as we start off Friday, but generally a cold start for many. Now, through Friday, we're going to see the rain eventually peter out across northeastern parts of the UK. Another area of rain approaches the northwest of Scotland, but elsewhere, plenty of fine weather, staying dry for the most part. And an increased easterly breeze through the weekend will bring a reduction in fog, but it also brings some colder air. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's That's about hypocrisy. standards and public life. That's no, hypocrisy. I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, That's Narinda. Hypocr I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GV News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hey, welcome along to tonight's Mark Stein Show. Happy St Andrew's Day to our Scots viewers. Could be worse, could be St David's Day, and that might be a bit of a downer after last night. We try to cover the stuff that matters to you on this show. Dominic Raab being beastly to the typing pool doesn't really matter to you, but Dominic Raab and his miserable colleagues being beastly to the entire country does matter. We have some shocking numbers that testify to a total Conservative failure on a policy of crucial importance to the base. And then we have a few less existential failures for you too, just to lighten things up. David Starkey, a great historian, is here, as is our stat man, Jamie Jenkins, and an indomitable survivor of the hellhole of Telford, uh, Samantha Smith 
is here. And um, uh, my uh, fourth guest is surviving, just about, just about, but no thanks to His Majesty's Government. Claire Hibbs is here. Plus, the most important part of the show, that's you. What's on your mind? What's your take? On the future of this once great land brought low by the charlatans over the river. Uh, you can email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk, or you can tweet me at gbnews. Grab yourself a cuppa or a snifter, according to taste. It's all coming your way after Tatiana Sanchez with the latest news. Thank you, Mark. This is the latest from the GB Newsroom. The Prince of Wales says there's no place for racism in society. The statement coming after a royal aide was forced to resign over comments made at a reception. Ngozi Falani, who's the founder of a domestic abuse charity, says she was repeatedly asked by Prince William's godmother where she really came from. Lady Susan Hussey then challenged her after she told her she was born in the UK and is British. Kensington Palace says the comments were unacceptable and it was right for her to step aside with immediate effect. More than 10,000 ambulance workers have voted to strike across nine trusts in England and Wales next month. Unite Union, the latest to announce staff walkouts. They're joining thousands of 999 call handlers, ambulance technicians and paramedics who are also set to walk off the job. Other strikes will hit National Rail, as well as other train operators, and more than 100 Eurostar staff will stop work. The announcements follow today's action by university and college union members and postal workers. The government has asked police for the use of 400 cells to house prisoners because of overcrowding. Prisons Minister Damien Hines told MPs there's been an unprecedented increase in the number of offenders over the last few months. He says it's partly due to the criminal bar association strike over the summer, which saw more people on remand. HSBC will close 114 bank branches across the UK. It says the decision comes as remote banking soars in popularity, with mobile app users almost tripling since 2017. The bank has also seen a decline in footfall since the COVID pandemic. It plans to invest tens of millions of pounds updating its remaining branches. A major trial of an experimental Alzheimer's drug has shown for the first time that early stages of the disease can be slowed. Scientists found after 18 months, lecanemab stalled progression by 27% compared with patients taking a placebo. However, experts warn as the medicine works during the initial stages of the disease, most won't benefit unless there's a revolution in spotting it. Labour leader Sakir Starmer has accused the Prime Minister of being weak during a heated PMQs this afternoon. Rishi Sunak came under fire from the opposition over private school funding, failure to maintain house building targets and the latest series of industrial action. And Fleetwood Mac singer-songwriter Christine McPhee has died at the age of 79. Her family said she passed away peacefully this morning following a short illness. The band has paid tribute to her on Twitter, calling McVie truly one of a kind. TV online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now it's back to Mark Stein. The United Kingdom is undergoing a phenomenal socio-cultural demographic transformation, unprecedented in any long-settled society outside of war or pestilence, such as the Black Death or some such, as we mentioned yesterday with Kate Hoey. Certain demographic shifts fascinate the media. For example, the very slight adjustments between unionists and nationalists in Northern Ireland. If the number of Protestants in County Fermanagh declines by 27 and the number of Catholics inches up by 34, the BBC is happy to run in-depth analyses showing that loyalism is dead and about to be shoveled into the landfill of history. But certain rather more startling demographic shifts pass without comment by the media big boys. Yesterday, my colleague Nigel Farage tweeted out 
The latest numbers from the Office of National Statistics, which he summarised as follows. According to the ONS figures, London, Manchester and Birmingham are now all minority white cities, to which Sajid Jabbit, remember him? He was uh, late Majesty's Principal Secretary of State for Health. We kept trying to get him on the show and he kept giving us the bums rush night after night. Anyway, Sajid Jabbit responded to Nigel's observation as follows. So what? So what? Don't you just love the crap servative party? Mr. Jabbit is the quintessential crap servative man. Yes, yes. I know calling those guys over there the crap servative party isn't exactly Noel Card level brittle wit. I'm not going to be elbowing Oscar Wilde out of the dictionary of quotations with that one. But to be honest, after 12 years of crap servitism, the crap servative party doesn't merit anything witty or amusing or sophisticated, so frankly, I can't be bothered. However, if you don't like me renaming them the crap servative party, why don't we tip our hat to Sajid Jabbit and rename this unlovely collection of buffoons, shysters, and sellouts the So What Party? Sing it, Sajid! Oh, look, here's an 87 year old man waiting 15 hours for an ambulance. So what? Oh, my energy bill seems a tad higher than it used to be. So what? Oh, the tax burden is the highest since 1948. Altogether now says Sajid, so what? All brought to you by the So What Party. So what, Sajid? So what, son? So what, Sajid? This country is almost done. But since So What, Sajid has posed the question, let's try to answer it. According to the Office for National Statistics, in London, only 36.8% of the population are, quote, white British. That's to say, English. Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish. I should declare up front, I don't really have a dog in this fight. Uh, I don't have a drop of any of those various bloods in me. My uh, paternal grandmother uh, was Irish, but from south of the border. So for some reason, the Office of National Statistics uh, regards her as foreign, although that's not how I think of it. Uh, anyway, to all that, uh, so what, Sajid sneers, so what? So what? Well, it's odd, outside of conquest by war, to become a minority in your own capital city within a generation. If the BBC reported that Tokyo is now only 36.8% Japanese, it would be odd. If The Guardian reported that Peking was now only 36.8% Chinese, it would be odd. If Lagos in Nigeria fell within nothing flat to 36.8% black, if New Delhi's current population of 90% Hindu fell to 36.8% Hindu, it would be odd, odd. And just to keep it non-racial, if Budapest suddenly announced it was 36.8% Hungarian, or Kyiv were only 36.8% Ukrainian, it would be odd. Especially if, like, So What Sajid and the So What Party, your base voted to, quote, take back control of the borders, and you, so what Sajid and so what Boris and so what Theresa all represented yourselves as the fellows who would do it, who would take back control. This week, Albanians took control of the streets of central London and Christian Wakeford, who was elected as a crap conservative, but earlier this year crossed the floor to join Labour. Sned, what's the big deal? Only 0.4% of the UK population is Albanian. 0.4% of 67 million is 268,000, which is 10% of the entire population of Albania now living in the UK. What are they doing when they're not doing wheelies in their Mercs and Lamborghinis on Westminster Bridge? Well, here's the non-native prison population of the UK in 2022. And uh, rocketing up to hit sound number one there, right out of nowhere, straight in at number one with close to twice as many jailbirds as their nearest rivals are the Albanians. And given that under Britain's pitiful, useless so what constabulary, only 1.3% of reported crimes even result in a charge or summons, I'd say that's probably 
a rather severe undercount of their criminality. Still, we can always use more Albanians, right? The Guardian's George Monbeo tweets, I was brought up in a village that was almost exclusively white and Christian. It was the most boring and stifling place I've ever known. Well, don't worry about it, George. On these numbers, they'll all be gone soon. Let me know what you think, GB Views at GBNews.uk. So what? Says so what, Sajid, but it means something. The only question is precisely what. The eminent historian, Dr. David Starkey, is here. Let me ask you about that Guardian guy's uh, tweet there. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't seem terribly psychologically healthy to be cheering on your own, uh, y y your own societal demise in that I way. I suppose especially when you're called <laughs> Monbio, if mm. one's, uh, one's allowed to, <laughs> to call attention to, to, to that kind of thing. <clears throat> one of the things that's there are several things, mm. big strands. I mean, mm. there's one that you've highlighted, mm. which is uh, that we have actually, emigration has represented 10% mm. of the gross population mm. in the last decade. Mm. Now, that is a sta th mm. Those are the kind of figures that you would expect in immigrant societies like Canada, like yeah. America, rather than a stable European country. It's an extraordinary increase. But... The other face of this is one of them is mm. the self-hatred, mm. the self-hatred of somebody like Monbiot. And mm. this goes back a very, very long way. Mm. This, you know, this is this is something that that you will find uh, in Gilbert and Sullivan, Gilbert right. and Sullivan are fashionable right. because of the attack on the ENO. Yeah. But the the the, the, the the great song in the Mikado, those who sing the praises of every century but this and yes. every country but their own. And then George Orwell in mm. his great essay, The Lion and the Unicorn, mm. the British intellectual which, of course, George <laughs> Mondrio, is an absolutely <laughs> archetypical British uh, intellectual, they see that Britain is somehow not like Europe. And uh, Europe has got food. Europe uh, has got ideas. Uh, Europe has got sophistication. We want to be like them. So there's that. And then I think there's... there's well, there are other things as well. We've always had, fundamentally, a rather weak central identity. Being British was always for export. Mm. Back home, you were... We were talking about this last yeah, week. Yeah, Back home, you're English, you're Scots, you're Irish. And this weak identity, this, mm. this, this weak formal, in other words, what appears on your passport... Yeah, yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons why this has gone, as it were, slipped under the radar, why it's possible to do a so what. In Hungary, there's a thing called a Hungarian. Well, In France, there's a thing called a Frenchman. Here, what is there? There is no such thing as British. Well, well, it's only, if we go back to 19, whatever it was, the 1948 British Nationality Act, which made a quarter of the world British subjects, mm. and just on the eve of the age of mass immigration, the formal position of His Majesty's government was that there is no distinction between Precisely. a British subject in Kingston here, Kingston, Ontario, Kingston, Jamaica, Jamaica. or Kingston anywhere else. We're, we're all just British subjects. But this, we've gone beyond, I think we've gone beyond that now because um, th this self-hatred, this self-loathing, uh, you know, Britishness is only invoked by people like George to complain about how white bread, Christian, tedious, No, 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 no. Mm. Englishness. Mm. Englishness mm. is the hate nationality. Of course, mm. it's the Scots hates nationality, yeah. but it's also the intellectuals. Britishness was very cleverly redefined mm. by Gordon Brown and a group of, as it were, alienated intellectuals, uh, one of whom is now chairman of the British Academy, Sir mm. David Canadine, in mm. the 1990s. Uh, Oh, yeah. We're the only country that says its essential defining national characteristic is tolerance. We don't stand for anything. We stand indeed for anything. We will <laughs> take anything. And there's a measure of truth in it, isn't there? I mean, well, I can think of no other country where barricades wouldn't have been mounted. Because, one again, mm. one of the very peculiar things about English Britain is this... 
the very power of its unspoken sense of identity. May I tell you a little story? Yeah. We're going back to the days of LSE when I, I was there for many years, and its director was this insufferably pompous German twit called Sir, uh, became the Lord Darendorf. And Darendorf <laughs> was, was extraordinary. Yeah. He was a man without any sensitivity, and he would hold these dreadful dinners. Mm. The food in LSE was indescribable. The <laughs> only thing you could possibly eat was the pudding. Oh, and yeah. just as the pudding was going to, onto the table, Ralph would... Ladies and gentlemen, we are not here simply for the sensual pleasures, uh, but to discuss the future of the school, at which point <laughs> your pudding was torn away. And we all... Do you know what we did? We laughed. Mm -hmm. Because we said, oh, he's German. Right. And so for, foreigners have forgiven anything. Yeah. The peculiar... Englishmen despise each other. Yeah. Foreigners are merely tolerated. Yeah. Because isn't it striking? There have been no demonstrations in the streets, no political party with occasional gestures from dear Nigel has dared to make an issue of it. This but, extraordinary silence. But can that go... Well, I think it's a misguided... No, I'm, I'm just, I'm no, just, I, you're asking I, I me, you're when, asking me uh, to do a historian and yeah, to try no, to analyse why, 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 why we are now... Yeah, yeah, but, but is it because we think we're stronger than we are? I was once told that the, uh, our new king, for example, when he used to go to a church, he he'd, it would be understood he'd be visiting such and such a place and he'd be attending church. So people say, oh, oh gosh, the Prince of Wales is going to be there. Uh, I must go. And so on that Sunday morning, the church would be packed and he would look around and think, I, the Church of England seems in pretty good shape to me. Mm, not a Don't... bad job being future Supreme Governor, and, is it? And, <laughs> and isn't that a bit the way, looking at the... that 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 people think we're in a much stronger position than than we are, but that the, just the Albanian numbers, but also all the others show that, you know, English, Scots, Welsh, Irish going to be entirely peripheral and irrelevant in, in a decade or two. <sighs> you, I'm not sure. You see, again, I think Monbiot mm. had a point. Go outside those big cities mm. and it's very, very Different. There are three other places that really do have non-white majorities. Mm. It's Leicester, it's Luton and it's Slough. But mm. over great swathes of England, mm. England, Scotland, mm. Wales are still what they always were. This is a big city phenomenon. And remember, the English have always been very doubtful about cities. You know, some mm. of the greatest Englishmen hated London. The, uh -huh. you know, the, 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 the Cobbets, the Great Wen. There's a, my neighbours in Kent, and they're only 60 miles away, half of them think London's really rather strange, odd place. Yeah, but so, won't the th yeah. these numbers will be uh, eventually reflected in... I mean, there was some guy arrested in Gloucestershire uh, for 28 people drowning uh, coming across, he's being uh, charged with uh, for the crime of allowing these people to dr drown. He's in the Cotswolds, mm. and his name is he Abu. He must be very rich. Abu. Well, he's, he's gotten rich on the <laughs> yeah, uh, on the proceeds on the proceeds of criminality. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah. But his name's Abu Bakr or whatever. That isn't what people would have thought of as a traditional. I don't want to go all Lady no. Susan Hussey on you, but that wouldn't have been thought of as a traditional <laughs> Cotswold name a couple of a uh, couple of years ago. In the end, it will be everywhere, won't it? If the demographic energy is is not with one group and is and is with others. I was in Navan uh, in Ireland, just not uh, whatever it is, an hour north of uh, Dublin, and uh, which I hadn't been in a few years, like full of covered women in Navan in Ireland. And you think, well, what the hell would uh, De Valera or uh, uh, Michael Collins make of that? You know. Well, we know exactly what De Valera would have made of these rather keen on nuns, I seem to remember. <laughs> <laughs> but the... <laughs> I think you're evading the central point no, there, I'm, David. No, it's a I, cute answer, no, but... I uh... am, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help you to explain mm. why, this is, why this is not an issue of greater political sal mm. salience than it is. And, of course, another thing, which is, again, there's been a very powerful measure of censorship. The Lady Susan Hussey mm. illustrates this 
this story very clearly. Mm. From from the point from the very moment of Enoch Powell's sixty eight speech, yeah. the entire political class, the entire as as it were intellectual elite, every organization has there's been a willful conspiracy of suppression and silence. This is yeah. and it it has worked. Things are unsayable. And yeah. I don't see any sign of that breaking. And it, uh, and do I you, wish you'd, do uh, you, do you? No, actually, I wish you'd told me that before the show. I wouldn't even have brought up this topic. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> it's, no. It's, no, you're right, it's, un, it's unsayable. But that's why it's, that's why it's happened. You can't go from 90% to 36% without anybody talking about it. As I said, the contrast with these obsessions with micro-adjustments <laughs> in certain Ulster counties is incredible and ridiculous. But you can't talk about what's happening before for your eyes. It's the crime of noticing. Uh, thank you very much, David. Coming up next, we're going to get your take on all this, and our stats man, Jamie Jenkins, will play it strictly by the numbers. Uh, plus, speaking of so what, Sajid, Claire Hibbs is here. So what, Sajid screwed her over, and his successors in the so what party are continuing to screw her over. And Samantha Smith is here with her own take on Lady Susan Hussey's defenestration from the royal household. It's all coming up. Don't touch that dial. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's That's about hypocrisy. standards and public life. That's no, hypocrisy. I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, That's Narendra. Hypocr I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. GB News is the people's channel, so let us channel what the people are saying about uh, the United Kingdom's accelerating demographic transformation. Alan says, 
Uh, if it happened in the developing world or even Ukraine, it would be called ethnic cleansing. The UN would be passing resolutions condemning it, and Western countries would be introducing sanctions against the perpetrators. John says it means the vandals are in Rome, burning the place down while successive PMs play the fiddle to con us all. Goodbye to the British, and I hope future Marxist revisionist historians won't be too unkind to us when we've gone extinct. No, no, no. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, look at, look at these museums. Uh, throughout Britain that hate their inheritance, that cancel exhibitions uh, that they've uh, been running for years and are hugely popular with the public because they're not anti-colonialist enough. They're, they're going to hate you even when you're dead, John. So uh, better when you pick out a grave, try and pick out one that's good for dancing on. Alice's dad says, honestly, who really cares? This country has been a melting pot of, oh, a melting pot of people from different countries for hundreds of years. Uh, no, 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 completely wrong, Alice's dad. Yeah, there have always been a, a few little bursts of small, modest immigration, like the Huguenots. But basically, uh, all the people who uh, immigrated into the British Isles between 1066 and 1952 as smaller than the number that arrives in a typical year now. So you're full of crap, Alice's dad. That's how you lose your country, thinking that it's normal for the United Kingdom to wind up with 10% of the population of Albania. Uh, or basically 20% of the male population of Albania living here. This is per that idiot Labour MP in Berry up in Lancashire. Um, uh, that's not normal. And you rationalising it as normal uh, are actually part of the problem. You'll lose your country because of that. And uh, frankly, you deserve to, taking refuge in half-wit ahistorical fantasies. Magnus says the rate of change is problematic. Medical services are increasingly overwhelmed. Oh, come on! It's just a three-year waiting list for a hernia, ten-month waiting list for the maternity ward. Why make such a big deal about it when we can bring in more Albanians and they get to see a GP twice a week? Uh, educational provision is increasingly <laughs> compromised. You don't need an education. You just need to know that Britain is the uh, f source of all the bad stuff in the world. The colonialism, the imperialism, the racism, that's it. Integration is challenging because of ghettoization. The immigrants don't need to integrate with you, Magnus. You need to integrate with them. Lawlessness is rising exponentially. Fear is increasing within communities. It isn't going to end well. It isn't going to end well. On the trend lines of this week's ONS figures, the native population of the British Isles will be statistically irrelevant to the future of this land and the lifetimes of our children. And one notes yet again that multiculturalism is a unicultural phenomenon. China, the world's dominant nation, is a conventional old-school ethnostate uh, that just happens to be one billion strong. No Albanian sex traffickers running around Wuhan. Our resident stat man Jamie Jenkins is here. Jamie. Uh, you were with the Office of National Statistics. What's this about the uh, ONS? This, will, this is going to be the last time the ONS does this uh, national origin question. Is that, is that correct? Uh, that, that's news to me. I'm not quite sure. I think, they, they, I think they'll be collecting it on the census, but it's more difficult to get those kind of in-year, 10-year kind of updates because of the government systems, I think, Mark, in terms of that. Oh. OK, that's, that's, uh, that's interesting uh, to know. Just, just like uh, not bringing race or, you know, any things like that into it, just on these numbers, on the steep decline decade on decade, uh, is, is this entirely normal? Well, I think being a statistician, it's good to look at the long term. So if we go back 100 years, Mark, the, the UK population was mm -hmm. 38 million people. So... Is currently 67 million people. So we've seen a massive, massive rise over the decades, 29 million more people across the population. Now, I think looking forward is very interesting in terms of what the ONS data is showing because they, they project what the population would look like. So they're saying now over the next 100 years, 
the population is only going to rise by 3.6 million. So that's about a tenth of what we've seen over the last 100 years. But what the figures don't show, and this is coming, Mark, this is coming to the UK over the next 100 years, what those figures kind of underplay, I suppose, is, is the dramatic change in British society, because what they're projecting is over the next 100 years, we lose 17 million people in the UK population due to natural change. That's because we're having far fewer births mm. now, the number of deaths. And to top that population up, we'll have another 21 million net immigration over the next 100 years. So, so you think the population may not look like the numbers are going to change dramatically over the next 100 years to what we've seen in the last 100 years, but it's going to be entirely driven by net immigration coming in. And those are numbers, Mark, where you're talking a, a kind of an assumption of around 205,000 net immigration uh, kind of a year. And remember what we saw last week, we had half a million people coming in. So it could even be a much bigger kind of number when you look over the kind of the impact of immigration on the wider UK population over the next 100 years. Well, you you said uh, you you tweeted out uh, the other day that the Albanian population, the Albanian incomers, the Albanian immigrants, uh, have gone up something like I think you worked it out to three thousand seven hundred and forty-two percent, something like that. That's big. That's obvious. That's in your face. They were certainly in your face on the bridges behind me the other night. And yet, even that, uh, even a provocation such as that doesn't seem to change the muted political discourse on this topic. No, and, and obviously most of the Albanians are now coming in via kind of what you would class as the illegal route over the channel. And, and you only got to go back before this year, Mark. There was very few Albanians coming across at all. Um, and what the Home Office figures came out last Thursday, they tell us how many people are coming across on these small boats every single quarter. Mm. And, and you're right, it's, it's like a 4,000% increase in the number coming over when you look at mm. July to September now versus July to September last year. And, and the second is Afghanistan, third's Iran, fourth's Iraq, and fifth is Syria. But Albania is off the scale. It's, it's over three times more than the second highest country. Mm. And I've seen nothing in the data to suggest that, at the, you know, there's no non-economic reasons for the Albanians coming over. But I think what the wider immigration figures that the ONS published last week showed, Mark, is that, you know, we had a net immigration of 500,000. Just how sustainable is that? You know, yeah. we've got... The big natural change issue, Mark, is the fact that we got fewer births than what you would, you know, to sustain the population of the UK. If no. you go back to 2001, or to 2002, to buy a house, it was about 4.8 times your salary. It's now nine times your salary. And a yeah. very interesting statistic, Mark, in terms of the impact of people buying houses later, kind of not being able to live with their partners till later, is in the latest figures show that by the age of 30, yeah. half of women now are childless. Where if you go back to the 1950s, yep. it was just one in four. So that, I think, is the birth crisis yeah, because, that the government needs to get a hold of. No, no, that's, but that too derives from immigration because people who, uh, as you say, would have had three children by the time they were 27 uh, are still living with mummy and daddy and don't get to move into their own bedsit until they're 38 and have one little... So instead of having 2.4 kids, they have one little yuppie designer kid uh, when mummy's 43. Uh, and even those people, I would bet, are going to actually be leaving the country because they can't afford anywhere to live. So if they can find a reasonably pleasant country, I don't know where it is, Slovenia or Tajikistan, where you, where you could actually have a, a small house with a bit of a garden rather than waiting till you're 58 and being able to afford a bed set. Uh, all they, we always like getting the numbers for you, Jamie, because the numbers do not lie. Well, they do sometimes. They do play fast and loose with them sometimes, but the, the hardcore data doesn't. Thank you very much, Jamie. Coming up, we have a grand survivor from the hellhole of Telford. Miss Samantha Smith is here. To weigh on, uh, in on uh, Lady Susan Hussey. Big royal story. That's coming up. Don't go anywhere. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online. 
across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let well, him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Speaking of transformative demographics, Lady Susan Hussey is an Earl's daughter who is the widow of a BBC chairman and a godmother to the Prince of Wales. She served as woman of the bedchamber uh, to the late Queen and then lady of the household to his present majesty. What the hell does that mean? Well, decade in, decade out, Lady Susan was the woman walking behind Her Majesty all over the Commonwealth. Here she is in my hometown of Toronto. Let's have a look at this. There's the Queen, and behind the Queen is Lady Susan, and behind Lady Susan, oh, there's our old chum, the former Canadian Cabinet Minister Jason Kenney, who's been on this show. So if you're playing Six Degrees of Regal Bacon, that's a royal flush right there. Lady Susan Hussey held the Royal Household Long and Faithful Service Medal with the extra bars for 30 40, 50, and 60 years of service. Well, Lady Susan's 60 years of long and faithful service have all come crashing down. She's out of here. She's gone. Stick a fork in her. She's done. After repeatedly asking Ngozi Fulani, the founder of the domestic abuse charity Sister Space, where she was from, and refusing to take I'm from here, I'm as British as you as an answer. Samantha Smith is back with us. What do you make of this, Samantha? Well, I think that it's it's all being blown up into a massive uh, issue of the culture wars and political correctness, political ideology. It's it's especially in, in the wake of Meghan's, Meghan's mm. and Harry's explosive new book that and mm. that everything that's been going on with that with that fiasco. Uh, what I find fascinating overall is just how quick. Prince Charles, uh, King Charles, yeah. apologies, and the Prince of Wales have been to brand Lady Hussey a racist. Mm. Frankly, this is an 83-year-old woman who was, yes, 
misguided and yes, quite outdated in her line of questioning, but let's not mistake misguided curiosity for malicious intent. I don't think for a second that Lady Hussey intended to offend or to, uh, to demean or to degrade the, 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 found, the CEO and founder of, of Sister Space for her ethnic background. I think that as, as uh, a mixed race kid growing up in a predominantly mm. white area, I've faced every line of questioning, every slur, every insult and every, and every intellectual curiosity there is. I've been called a dirty N-word. I've All been right. asked, do you speak English? I've been asked, you know, where, where do you really come from? And I quickly learned the distinction between those who are misguided but well-meaning, who just want to know a little bit more about you and uh, uh, intrigued by your... Uh, your diverse background versus those that want to cause you harm and, and are going to hold it against you. Well, I, I can understand what, you know, you're from Telford, so you don't want to, when you're in Telford, you don't want to be asked where you're from. I, I bought my place in the American state of New Hampshire in, uh, let, me, let me work this out now, 1990. And for decades, whenever I just go into some little general store, people say, oh, where are you, where are you from? You know, it's, and, and I, it's, I can see it's irritating, it's annoying. But there is something pathetic about, as you say, an 83-year-old woman whose six decades of service end with the royal household damning hers. I don't believe she would have survived six decades one step behind the Queen if mm. she were a racist, because the Queen is certainly uh, one of the least, uh, most non-racist people mm. uh, that this country has ever produced. Pre precisely. Quite frankly, I don't think that the Queen would tolerate a racist. I don't mm. think that this this burning at the stake of Lady Hussey is is warranted or necessary. It's, it's interesting how many people are saying that age is no excuse for bigotry or racism, mm. and yet they're saying that she should know better. If she comes from that generation, this is this is how she grew up. My my nan still calls people coloured. My my mm. nan also said that you know you have a special tan that'll never wash off. She said, she told yeah. me that when I was eight years old. It isn't because she was a racist. In fact, mm. as uh, in a similar way to the Queen, she's one of the most non-racist people I've ever met. And yet, well, if she were in Lady Hussey's shoes, she would be being tossed out on her on her rear end and told, you know, you awful awful bigoted person. How dare you go and go and think about what you've done for the rest of your life? Well, well, look realistically on the numbers we were talking about earlier. There aren't going to be any uh, Lady Susan Hussies in the UK's mm. future. Really, she's the past. Uh, something else is on its way. There's, uh, there's an odd lack of humanity in consigning her to the dustbin of history. Precisely, and, and you were right to emphasise her six decades mm. of loyal, faithful service, unpaid service, might I add, mm. to mm. the Queen and to the royal household. It's, it's, it's frankly a little bit deplorable, in my opinion, that they are so quick to turn their backs on an individual who has has been called by Prince William, by King Charles, by the Queen as more like family than yeah, um, than yeah. employee. And the, uh, it, it creates an impression well, that the that the older generation uh, are consigned to the to the trenches of the past that they have no yeah. opportunity to learn and and have a place in modern society because the the moment they slip up they're going yeah, to be to be damned and and branded a racist or a bigot. No, I think that uh, there's something faintly creepy to me about mm. a godson uh, damning his godmother as racist. I'm not terribly keen on uh, that. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Samantha. We're always glad to see you. Stump the Stein looms. You can ask me anything. GB Views at GBNews.UK. And coming up, Claire Hibbs is here, one of the vaccine victims whose story we've told on this show over the past several months. She's back with us because Britain's ghastly so-what government will not stop screwing her over. That's next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. 
We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Hello, I'm Esther Agbey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. So what Sajid seems a tougher sell, uh, but man Hancock, his non-socially distant predecessor doing those uh, non-socially distant tongue sarnies with his aid, uh, Matt Hancock has apparently won the nation's hearts on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, for which he was paid 400 grand. That's over three times more than you get if you followed Matt Hancock's advice and got the jabber, 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 and then died or were crippled by it. For I'm a celebrity, you get 400,000 quid in nothing flat. For being crippled by the vaccine, you get 120,000 pounds max. Uh, I believe over half of those who've received that pathetic compensation have been guests on this show, but Matt and So What Sajid's chums are slow walking the payments in hopes you'll be dead before they have to cut the check. Claire Hibbs, who was on our Vax Victim special, took the AstraZeneca as Matt and So What Sajid told her to, and she's been hung out to dry. She's been diagnosed, this is an official diagnosis, that it was the vaccine that did it to her. Uh, she's been diagnosed with vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, and more recently with fibromyalgia, and she's still being given the runaround by the vaccine damage payment scheme. Claire is your fellow citizen and needs your help because of what So What Sajid and those guys over the river have done to her. How are you feeling, Claire? Um, good days, bad mm. days, mainly mm. bad days. I, um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting there. I, it's, it's difficult to, um, to every day have something different. There's mm. always something new. Um, I, I have lots and lots of pains all over mm. my body, chronic fatigue, mm. uh, that it's, um, and I'm always ill. I've got my immune system is rock bottom. I've got yeah. hardly any immune system. Well, basically, all. it just did a number on your immune system. So uh, you, you're you just getting everything yeah. uh, that's kind of in the air. Yeah. Um, 
what's the official explanation for why you have, because uh, I think it's whatever it was, six, seven, eight months ago, the, nine months ago that you were first on this show. Yeah. Why haven't you got the 120 grand yet? Because you can't work, you, you're you eating into your savings and all yeah. kinds of things. Yeah, well, we've got no savings now. Mm. Um, we're literally now a uh, wage down in the household and um, struggling. And the vaccine damage payment scheme just, and it's not just me, the excuses that they make mm. constantly is, it, it started off with um, them blaming hospitals mm. and um, the NHS for not sending in medical records so they couldn't be sent off to the mm. medical assessors. This is happening with so many people uh, on a daily basis who we speak to on Twitter they're saying that their records, or that their claim has now been with medical assessors for over six months yeah. and they're still not hearing. Now, if originally when um, everybody was complaining about why it was taking so long for people mm. to be awarded, they were saying that uh, once it's gone to the medical assessors or your claim, yeah. you should be informed within 12 weeks. Yeah. Now... This is months for some people, and they've now changed the goalpost. And the officials say the, the official, now they're actually saying there is no time. We can, we cannot put a time frame on it. No, well that's that. This is discreet because even if not a single other person were to be totaled by these crappy failed vaccines oversold to you by boobs like Boris and all the other fellas, and and it's not true that people are. There's like guys are joining your list every yeah. day of the week. Last week, I said we could do this every night. That poor 14-year-old boy off the coast of uh, wherever it was, County Mayo in Ireland. Terrible stories, all in the newspapers, all the time. Another one today. Yeah. But basically, at the rate uh, the government is processing the existing numbers, it will be over 300 years before yep. all the present people get their compensation. So you would have to live to whatever it is, 327, uh, before you would get your payment. Yeah, yeah so in, in June, when uh, Vicky was the first mm. person to be awarded, uh, that month, I believe, there was probably 10 or 11 awards in that, that mm. month of June. We're now... December tomorrow, and the official figures are showing that now there have been 28 awards. Mm. So we're talking from June yeah. to now. Yeah. yeah, That's another 18 yeah. in six yeah. months. 18. So in six months, that's three a month. Yeah. So, that's three yeah. a month. This is, this is, I don't care what you feel about whether you love the lockdowns, whether you love the COVID, whether you love the vaccines. Claire is one of your fellow citizens, and it doesn't uh, speak well, even for a depraved uh, nation such as this, the heartlessness. Because you get this all day long on Twitter. Yeah. People accuse you, oh, you just, you woke up with a slight headache and said yeah. it must be the AstraZeneca. Yeah, they, the people on Twitter are, are horrendous. I mean, there's one particular person he, he commented, commented today, mm. he, he said, um, oh, the, the old rubbish and misinformation on mm. the Mark Stein show again. Mm. And, you know, and, and people call us liars all the time. Mm. And we, we have, obviously, we run Vib UK. Yeah. And we... That's, uh, that's Vaccine Injured and Bereaved yeah, UK, which is a, right. it's a group that these people have had to... All these other star charities that have all the celebrity endorsers, yeah. and you've just had to get on yeah. and do it yourself. Yeah, and we do... Um, we're now doing a, our own newsletter where mm. we're doing a story about one of our members, every issue, and we're now doing these ribbons. Um, since we've been doing the ribbons to mm. raise awareness for mm. people to wear... We have so many emails every day mm. telling us new stories about mm. what's happened. And it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking to see how many people are actually injured by this vaccine that, that you just don't hear about. No, I mean, Rishi Sunak is a billionaire. He's one of those fellows who became very wealthy, not doing anything terribly useful or productive. I don't quite know how he got a billion uh, quid out of it. But... I don't, you know, you should have enough human feeling inside you, you worthless excuse for a prime minister, yep. to understand that these people, in the, you've blown through all, you've spent all the money that's ever going to exist in this country this century. You should be able to find some 
uh, for Claire and her fellow sufferers who did what everybody from the green down told them to do. They're not... Do you get sick of being called a conspiracy theorist yeah, all the time. and an anti-vaxxer? Misinformation, anti-vaxxer, mm. conspiracy theorists. We get called the lot. And even when we say um, th this is fact, we were confirmed. This mm. and, and in the we don't bother anymore. It's not worth it anymore because no. it, it just there's no point. We no. we know the truth. She's not an anti-vaxxer. She's sick because yeah. she put that thing in her body. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Claire. We're thank gonna you. we're, we're going to try as usual. Whichever uh, cowardly person isn't the edu. Well, we're going to get one of these health secretaries. They change every fortnight, but we're going to get one of them on one of these uh, days. Dan Wooden is here to wallop your Wednesday like nobody's business. What you got for us, Dan? Mark Stein, good evening. We have a Red Wall special tonight. Nigel Farage and Lee mm. Anderson both in the studio. Are these the two men to solve the migrant crisis? <laughs> Plus, joining me from the US, our special correspondent for the royal tour, Mark Stein, a certain Samantha Markle, the estranged sister of the Duchess of Sussex. Mm. Who are they supporting over in the States? <laughs> William and Kate or <laughs> Meghan and Harry? She's got a fascinating perspective. OK, I, I love that Markle family. It's a, she's a very lonely lady, Miss Megan, in that family. That's all coming up with Dan on the best late night show in Brit Telly. Stay safe, stay free. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30 a.m. every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians.